the Swedish main battle tank under the index STRV-103, also known under the designation S, is of special interest, because for the first time in the world history of tank construction it was equipped with quite interesting design solutions, in particular, the installation of two different types of engines, diesel and gas turbine, the absence of a turret, a cannon fixed relative to the entire hull of the tank with targeting by means of hull rotations in the horizontal and vertical planes. Double armor, the main armor for vital units and crew and auxiliary armor for the crew. The crew of the Swedish tank consisted of three persons. The tank was mass produced from 1966 to 1971, in 1990s it was withdrawn from service and replaced by the German Leopard 2 tanks. In the first post-war years, Sweden did not develop new tanks. In 1953, 80 Centurion Mk3 tanks with an 83.4mm gun were bought from England, and a little later another 270 Centurion Mk10 tanks with a 105mm gun. However, these vehicles did not fully satisfy the Swedish army, so in the mid-50s the country started to consider the possibility of designing its own tank. The military leadership of the country was guided by the following military concept, a tank is an absolutely necessary element in the country's defense system both now and in the foreseeable future. It was especially necessary for the defense of the southern plains of Sweden and the Baltic Sea coast. Careful consideration of the geographical conditions of Sweden, along with the system of manning its army, led the designers to the conclusion that it would be advisable to search for a completely new tank concept that would perfectly fit the specific conditions of this Scandinavian country. According to specialists, the new tank had to surpass the Centurion in service and at the same time be easier to train the crew. To meet the requirements for tactical and operational mobility, the maximum weight of the tank was limited to 43 tons, and if possible, the tank had to be buoyant. These contradictory requirements were further complicated by the fact that the tank needed a decent armor protection, which would provide it with protection against the new ATVs. The search for a solution that would satisfy the requirements of reducing the tank's size and at the same time facilitate crew training led to the abandonment of the classic layout with a rotating turret and multilevel crew seating, mechanic driver in the hull and the rest in the turret. This arrangement, especially in view of the loader, who had to be given a space of almost human height, significantly increased the height of the vehicle. These considerations formed the basis for the concept of the new tank. The tank gun and its twin machine guns were rigidly mounted in the hull. Horizontal gun guidance was carried out using the conventional hydrostatic slewing mechanism, on dry ground the tank turned 90 degrees in a second, Vertical guidance was carried out by pumping oil in the hydropneumatic suspension from the front support rollers to the rear rollers and vice versa. By using unusual layout solutions, the designers were able to combine high firepower, good protection and mobility in a tank with a rather limited weight. The tank was designed as a casemate tank with the main armament mounted in the hull. The cannon, mounted in the frontal plate of the hull, had no possibility to pump horizontally and vertically. Guidance was carried out by changing the position of the hull in two planes. In the front of the tank was located the engine and transmission compartment, then the control compartment, which was at the same time a combat compartment. In the crew compartment, the commander was on the right of the gun, the driver mechanic was on the left, he also acted as gunner, and the radio operator was positioned behind him facing the stern. For a long time the developers faced the question of choosing a power plant, the cooling system of which would be located in a well-protected space behind the fighting compartment and inside the main armored hull. Additional protection for the cooling system was provided by large fuel tanks, which were mounted outside the main armored hull and had anti-shrapnel and anti-bullet armor. The space in the front part of the additional armored hull was considered suitable for the installation of inlet and outlet manifolds and air cleaners, since their damage in combat conditions would not cause immediate failure of the tank. This conclusion was confirmed during the tests, the tank could perform combat missions for several hours before it started to require repairs. The development of the tank's propulsion system began in 1959, 
After studying all possible options, the committee came to the unanimous conclusion that a combined diesel and gas turbine engine propulsion system should be used. In this installation they were attracted by the cost-effectiveness criterion, which for this tank was best suited. Firstly, it was, in fact, the only option that could be applied in the space available. All others would have required a significant increase in silhouette or weakening of the frontal protection. Secondly, mounting a diesel and GTE on either side of the gun on the tank allowed maintenance of these engines to be made accessible. Moreover, the combined propulsion system, each engine being able to provide the tank with mobility, albeit with a number of limitations, was more reliable in combat conditions. The main armament of the tank was a 105mm gun with a 62 caliber barrel length, which had a fairly simple automatic loader and a rate of fire of 15 rounds per minute. The loading magazine was connected to three ammunition magazines, which were located in the stern of the tank behind the fighting compartment. The number one magazine had four vertical shafts with five rounds horizontally, a total of 20 rounds, the number two magazine had five vertical shafts and the same number of rounds horizontally, a total of 25 rounds. The number three magazine had one row of five shells. Thus, the tank's ammunition complement consisted of 50 shells. The gun breech block and chocks were located above the magazines between the two cooling system blocks. This approach to the layout allowed for convenient filling of ammunition magazines and the best possible ballistic protection, the tank height not exceeding 1.9 meters. When reloading the gun, the fired cartridge case was ejected through the hatch located in the rear part of the vehicle. Together with the ejector located in the middle part of the barrel, this significantly reduced the gassiness of the tank's crew compartment. Reloading of the empty automatic loaders was done manually through two hatches located aft of the hull and took 5 to 10 minutes. On the left side of the frontal plate, two 7.62mm machine guns with 2,750 rounds of ammunition were mounted in a fixed armor casing. Their aiming was also carried out with the help of hull rotation, i.e. machine guns played the role of paired with the gun. The gun and machine guns were fired by the driver and the tank commander. Another machine gun was mounted on the turret above the tank commander's hatch, which could serve as an anti-aircraft gun. The turret could be equipped with an armored shield. The driver and the tank commander had binocular combined optics with variable magnification. The gunner's sight had a built-in laser rangefinder. The commander's observation devices were stabilized in the vertical plane, and the commander's turret in the horizontal plane. In addition, interchangeable periscopic units were used, for units were installed in the commander's turret, one in the mechanic driver's turret, and two units had a radio operator. All optics were covered by armored flaps. The tank protection was provided not only by the thickness of the hull armor, but also by sufficiently large angles of inclination of the armor plates, first of all, of the upper frontal plate of the hull. Additional protection was provided by the small area of the side and frontal projections, as well as the trough-shaped bottom of the tank. The constant growth in the effectiveness of the tank's weapons on the battlefield forced the Swedish engineers to undertake modernization of the STRV-103 tank, which had been Sweden's MBT for almost 30 years. First of all, it was necessary to improve the tank's protection against shaped charge ammunition. The design features of the upper frontal plate of the tank's hull did not allow the full use of mounted dynamic protection units, but the Swedish designers found a very original way out of this situation. In the front part of the hull they installed an armored steel grille, which was able to withstand up to four hits of anti-tank grenades. To protect the side Swedish engineers decided to use 18 hinged canisters, nine pieces on each side, this solution in addition to a significant increase in fuel supply, by 400 liters, would also serve as protection from shaped charge ammunition. What this Swedish tank was all about, many countries have not decided until now. For example, Great Britain, Australia and the USA gave it very high marks, but as an anti-tank self-propelled vehicle. The Swedes to the last considered their brainchild to be a full-fledged tank. The only thing it was never denied was the rather unusual nature of its design. 